But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All right, so seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That means that there's another kind of righteousness and there's another kind of kingdom, right? Because we're supposed to live in this world, but seek a different way of living. And not always easy, is it? And all the things that you thought you needed will be added to you by who? Your father who loves you. Just keep reminding yourself who your father really is. Keep making these confessions over yourself. And you can get the book, Experience in the Father's Embrace, by Jack Frost. Great book. Know, knew him well when he was still alive. He ministered here. Powerful book. At the end of the day, if you really want to know your identity, and you don't know that God is your father, you're going to spend a lot of time and energy on fakes and counterfeits. And you're going to find your identity in something that isn't redemptive for the kingdom of God. But say it out loud. I know the adopted spirit of Abba Father. All right? That's in the book of Romans. That's the text verse from last week. Is that you are not an orphan. You're not an outcast. But you've been adopted into God's family by which the spirit in you cries out, Abba Father. And when that happens, you want to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Again, it's a lot to talk about. So just understand when they heard the word righteousness in the days that Jesus, when, when the New Testament was written, they thought following the law was how you became righteous. And they couldn't read and write. A lot of them couldn't read and write. They were peasants. They were farmers. So the Pharisees who could read and write were, were always pulling rank on, on the regular average guy. And they were all regular average guys. Nobody went to public school. There was no reading and writing and all that. They just had to function and survive. So how would, I be right? how would I be righteous? They're righteous, and I can't live up to their standard. So Jesus is saying, listen, be careful. There's different standards, and they're not giving you the right one. I'm going to get into that a little bit here. So let's just think about the kingdom in, in Scripture for a minute. In Mark 10.30, it says, this age and the age to come. So we understand that when, when this life is over, it's not really over, Right? that your spirit is going to continue to live forever, whether you're saved or not. Woo, if you told that to some people, the atheists that think, this is it. I'm going to die and go into the, into the ground, and while I'm here, I'm going to eat, drink, and be merry. Neil Young had a song out when I was in high school that said, rust, I'm sorry, no, I, it's better to burn out than it is to rust. <laughs> right? That's a renegade concept. Just have as much fun as you can while you're here because once it's over, it's all gone. Well, no. no. We know as Christians that's a wrong thing. That's a lie. That this life is just a shadow of what's going to come. That next life is going to be amazing. But so can this life be amazing. Anybody feel like you have an amazing life right now? I mean, that's just understanding the blessings of God in us. Right? So maybe more hands will be raised by the end here. <laughs> it wasn't like a real strong surge there. <laughs> so 2 Corinthians 1.22 says, He has marked us with his seal and placed his spirits in our hearts as a guarantee. All right? So, Pastor Peter, are you elevating the Holy Spirit above Jesus and God the Father? No. But I also don't want to demote him either. He's an equal member of the Godhead. And why would Jesus say that anyone who's in the kingdom is greater than the greatest prophet of the Old Testament, which was John the Baptist? Because we have the Holy Spirit. We're baptized in the Holy Spirit, and he was too. When he came into ministry, they heard a voice. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And that started his ministry. And because he lived a sinless life and died and was resurrected, the Holy Spirit was, re was released to all the earth. All flesh. Isn't that amazing? And when you become a Christian, you can't be a Christian without having Holy Spirit, but you can let him lay dormant in your life. One of the reasons we fast and pray is so that we can hear his voice more clearly. We deny our flesh. We, we rearrange our priorities and say, yeah, food's important. I get it. But it's not more important than God. And, and making money is important, but if I'm close to God, I'll make more money. Because I'll be a better employee. I'll hear his voice. He'll warn me about landmines on my job, which could be named, you know, whoever in, in the other department that's got it in for you. Show me the landmines, Lord. Don't lead me into temptation, but 
Walk me around. I want to have your goggles on, and I want to miss all those things. And when I find out they wanted me to blow up, I'm going to bless them. And they're going to be really mad. It's like pouring coals of fire because they wanted to blow me up, and now I'm blessing them. That's the kingdom. But it's hard, isn't it? Because your inner Italian wants to call your, um, your cousin Vinny. <laughs> he has marked us with his seal and placed his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. And I love this part. A down payment of things to come. And if you read King James, I'm sure many of you were raised on King James. That was the only Bible in the church that me and Trisha, we were told that was what they read in heaven. And it had to be a black cover, too. <laughs> they call it earnest. In the King James. That was a down payment if you were going to buy something. Anybody ever put, put things on layaway? Right? How cool is it when you go to make that next payment? This is really back in the old days. And the guy goes, oh, no, you're done. You don't have to make any more payments. You can have the dress now. You can, that wasn't me, but maybe it was my wife. You can have the coat that you were praying for. So just try to get your head around this. He's marked us with a seal and placed his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee, a down payment of things to come. And right above that says, Mark 1030, this age and the age to come. So we get a down payment in this age that gives us a taste of what it's going to be like. Partially now, fully then. But if you're ignoring the Holy Spirit in your life and you're not cultivating a relationship with him, it's really easy to get very legalistic. And if you're only cultivating the relationship with the Holy Spirit and ignoring the word, you're going to be flaky. And that's a kind way of saying it. So there's two kingdoms in the earth. There's the secular kingdom and then there's God's kingdom in the earth. And then there's two ages. The age we're in now and the age to come when Jesus returns. Guess what? This is our turn in this age. And when you're 90, you don't want to look back and say, I wish I took a better advantage of my time. Look, Jim's going to be 90 soon. He's like the Energizer Bunny. But I'm just saying, what are we waiting for? Let's jump in now. And it says, this is another author. He said, we live in the now and not yet. We taste the presence of God now, but we know there's still more to come. The presence of the future. When someone gets healed at the altar during worship, that's the presence of the future. That's the down payment that he promised us, that, that we could live in this kingdom heaven. As it is in heaven, let it be on earth, Lord. There's no sickness in heaven. We don't want sickness here. Now, here's what we do, though, often, is we try to produce a formula to manufacture healing or whatever. Boris talking about getting a raise on the job, right? I mean, I've known him a really long time. And some of you know Cam and Summer Johnson. Just amazing how God has blessed this business in their backyard. When I interviewed him, he said, you know, it's not really a big secret. The, the day I got saved, I started tithing. <laughs> you, know, you figure it out yourself if you want to do that or not. But there's just a lot of testimonies that talk about He said it today, right? Like, he has no ax to grind. I wasn't bribing him to say that. He, he just lives that way, and he gets blessed. And so if Cam and Summer, you know, that's, that's just a stand that they took. So as part of being the, the presence of the future being my life, I live my life by the rules of the kingdom, by the rules of engagement, right? Not my will, Lord, but your will be done. I know that my flesh is weak. My spirit might be willing, but my flesh is weak, so I'm going to fast and pray. I'm going to press in and hear what you have to say. And then I heard another author that I really liked. He said, heaven and earth are overlapping and interlocking. <laughs> like a zipper, right? They're connected. And he said he's a very present help in time of trouble. Not a million miles away, right there when you need him. But men, it's not weakness to ask for help. <laughs> Didn't get one amen for that one. So I'm going to try to unpack a little bit of why some of the, the difficulty is to understand this message is because, you know, the average person doesn't get to go away to Bible college and study Greek and Hebrew. And when they read the Bible, they read what it says. And in Matthew, the word, the, the phrase kingdom of heaven appears 32 times and nowhere else in the Gospels. 
If you go kingdom of God, he says it six times, Matthew does. I put arrows in here, I might as well tell you what I'm looking at. He says the kingdom of God six times. We already quoted it, seek first the kingdom of God, comes from Matthew. But most of the time he's referring to it, he says kingdom of heaven. And then all the other times, Mark, Luke, John, there's 55 times it says kingdom of God in all the gospels. So if you could just stretch a little bit here for me and say that they're equivalent terms, all right? You don't have to say it out loud, but thanks for being obedient. Think in your mind they're the same thing, kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God, and it might help you see what I'm about to teach you. It's not just the one-dimensional piece of life after death, right? We all know that's the age to come, but what about life after birth? <laughs> what about now? What about all of us sitting here right now, those of you that are watching online? Does he want this life to be beneficial and productive and uh, destroying the works of the devil? Please say yes. Right? You're not just waiting to die and go to heaven. You have a mission. There's a reason you're here. And if you don't know what it is yet, find out. Come up to the prayer line and say, I don't know what he's talking about. I, I always you know, thought of myself as a survivor. I was getting by. And God wants you to flourish, not just survive and not just get by. The enemy loves keeping us in that place. Now let's just look at, I'm sure, a part of scripture most of you have read. It's very famous. Guys hold up John 3.16 at football games, or at least they used to. Jesus answered and said to Nicodemus, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Everybody read that verse somewhere? And people translate that to me, well, if, if you die and you're not born again, you're going to hell. Now, is that true? Yeah, there's some truth to it, but is that what Jesus was saying here? Is that I can't see the thing he's asking me to seek if I'm not born again. So you can only seek something if you could see it, right? And then Nicodemus says, well, what do you mean? How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And what do we know, ladies, about mother's wombs? When the baby's ready to come, what do they do? Louder? You gotta break the water. Her water didn't break yet, right? Is this, like, not just me, right? You guys know this. The doctor was going to break Trisha's water, and I said, what are you going to do with that thing? I'm leaving. I'm going to the waiting room. You're not putting that in my wife. <laughs> so, look, you know, like, that's my interpretation of what he means here when he says, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water, your natural birth, your mother's womb, and the spirit, first birth, second birth, reborn, born again, he cannot enter the kingdom. So he's telling us to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And now he's saying, there's a way to enter it. I'm going to tell you now. You can live in this life in the kingdom of God, but it's completely on you to make those decisions. Because as soon as you drift off into sin, and can we just be honest that Christians do this sometimes? Like, you get a car accident and you, and you lie on the insurance claim. <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus. You can come up and repent right now. <laughs> You're at the grocery store and they give you too much change and you keep it. Who's happy about that? The devil or God? How about this? Getting paid under the table. There's nothing about God that's under the table. Right? Thou shalt not lie. Written in stone, man. Like, wow, the spirit of truth is inside you. But we're like, yeah, but those insurance companies, they've been ripping me off for a long time. I mean, this is God giving me a blessing. <laughs> Flip that upside down. You get my point? Right. So we can focus on both life after death and life after birth. The life after birth is now. It's what we're doing. It's why we're here. And then he uses this phrase in Matthew 13 again. That I've been in Bible studies 
and I've had to kind of bite my tongue because I wasn't being asked to lead the Bible study. This is mostly in New York City in the, in the businessman world. And Jesus would say, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which, is, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it's grown, it's greater than the herbs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. Right? That's a popular understanding of mustard seed faith. And, and Jesus is saying even a tiniest little seed that looks like nothing can turn into this huge tree with branches that becomes a home for the birds. But guess what? That's not about when you die. He's not talking about heaven there. He's talking about the word of God and the kingdom of God here in the earth. It could start small. The Bible says despise not small beginnings. Because most churches that get planted start with just a few people. And that kingdom, operating in the kingdom because people get changed and healed and delivered, that causes their families to say, what the heck happened to you? And they're like, I don't know, but that lady Easter bad. she just prayed for me and something left. And I'm different now. And they're a little threatened by that. Like, what do you mean? What kind of church is it? And they're like, well, I don't know. It's kind of loud. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. Now, again, like, you could think that's heaven, life after you're alive here, only life after death, but no. We misread it. I'm sorry. I'm just going to tell you flat out. We've misread it. The treasure is Jesus Christ in this life. And it's like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found it hidden for the joy. He goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. I wasn't looking for it. He found me. I just happened to be walking through a field, and I kicked something, and I said, what is that? And it turned out it was a treasure. So instead of stealing it, he bought the field, and that's Christ in our lives. And then there's another one that's like it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. This would be Sam Harris becoming a Christian. You know who he is? Atheist? Yeah, like probably one of the most vocal atheists, right? And that's okay. He doesn't have another GPS. He doesn't, he, he's one of those people that would say God and church are equal. Look, they're not. Church is filled with fallible people in the pulpit. So if you're going to gauge it by that, there's always going to be a problem, right? But what about Jesus? What about God? What about seek first the kingdom of God? Church is important. I'd be crazy not to tell you that. Of course, we come together. Don't forsake the assembling together with other believers. But that can't be primary. Primary is your relationship with God. And then we outwork that relationship with each other, and we help each other, and we grow. So this is just similar to the last one, but in the last one, it was a surprise. This guy is already an expert on pearls. And that's why I said Sam Harris, because he knows all the other world philosophies. He just doesn't think Jesus is the pearl. But when that light goes on and he gets saved, he's the guy that sells everything else this is what Paul the Apostle did. He said, everything I used to count as important, I count it as trash now. The only thing that matters is to know him and be found in him. What a great life sentence, uh, life mission statement. And the last one, I'll just read it quickly. The kingdom of heaven is like, not when we die and go to heaven. The kingdom of heaven, Matthew's saying, the kingdom of God that's available now. I already asked you to buy into that. Because it's true. A dragnet cast into the sea, gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew it to shore. They sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of this age. Can't clearly, can't be talking about future then, right? He's talking about the day of judgment, the end of age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. They'll be wailing and gnashing of teeth. You all read this, right? I'm, I'm not misquoting the Bible. We don't talk a lot about the judgment day. And maybe that's because Jesus wasn't real big about shaming people to get into heaven. He, he drew people to him because they saw God in him. So it wasn't like, oh, well, you know, you better buy this insurance policy because if you die tonight, you're going to end up in hell forever. Now, look, if that's evangelism. And if it works, they get saved. Right? So any evangelism better than none. But if you get shamed into the kingdom you're going to be shamed in the kingdom. And it's hard to last. Better to be loved into the kingdom, and then you get to love others. I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, scribes and Pharisees, you'll by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Now, this was this is a part of Sermon on the Mount. I know what time it is. I'm, I'll start to head down the home stretch here. But a lot of people get confused on this. The people that were hearing it 2,000 years ago were really confused about it because they were just all the regular people of the culture. It's called the Sermon on the Mount, right? Lots of people, thousands of people there, all blue-collar people with no college education, didn't know how to read and write. Mostly there were some that some of the Pharisees were there. But he says... Unless your righteousness, Mr. Regular Guy, exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, you can't enter the kingdom of God, I'm going to say. Just the kingdom of heaven. This present kingdom that he wants us to live in, in the earth. Well, what does that mean? It's not that they weren't trying to live a righteous life. Paul would say this, right? I, I was above reproach. I knew the laws. I was following the laws. But you can't be saved by following the laws because you all have sinned. Even in following all those laws, I still would have ended up in hell. Because you can't gain your righteousness with God by following the law. Should you follow the law? Yes, of course. It's true. But you don't earn it. You can't earn it. You just receive it by faith. And then live your life to please God. And have people in your life that are willing to say to you, I'm worried about you. I'm, I'm seeing things that, you know, you didn't see the Father do. I, I'm seeing you doing things that you didn't see the Father do. And because I love you, I'm willing to risk the relationship. I'm not judging you. I'm not an authority over you. I just, I'm concerned about you for whatever. You fill in the blank. So that means for these blue-collar people, they had to understand that the righteousness of God, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness meant that there was another way to be righteous than just being A-plus on all the rules. Nobody likes A-plus on all the rules because we all are going to fall short. It's exhausting, isn't it? Nope. So they had to understand that there was a purity in a relationship with God that as you get out of the way, as John the Baptist said, as I decrease and you increase, I become more like you. And then I get the righteousness of God. He made him who knew no sin, know this one? To become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. And who knows what the limits of that are? Really, like who knows? What, read the book of Acts. Average people, Peter, like flawed as Peter is, he becomes a hero in the New Testament. Right? All because he understood there's a different way to live. I can operate in the kingdom of God while I'm here in this secular culture. Anybody believe me? All right, I'm going to go a little faster, and then I'll go to John 18. Again, probably a familiar portion of Scripture. Pilate entered the praetorium again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? So what, what do you think the answer to that question is? Is Jesus the king of the Jews? Say yes. Yes. So that's true. He is. But is he just king of the Jews? No, he's king of all humanity because all people have been made in his image. But they don't know it. Whose job is it to tell them? If you believe it. Oh, well, they might get offended. Well, they might spend eternity in hell, too. Thought you said you loved them. Jesus answered and said, are you speaking of yourself about this? Or did, like, this was a pretty bold thing to do, right? He's challenging Pilate. It's like, so did you come up with this question yourself, Pilate, or did somebody put you up to this? <laughs> and Pilate says, am I a Jew? It's your nation, and the chief priests have delivered you to me. What have you done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And just be careful. Be careful when you read that. In the context of this discussion, it doesn't mean that we don't have his kingdom in this world. It's not of this world. It's not sourced in sin. It's sourced in the Garden of Eden before sin. That's the kingdom that we're all going to have for eternity. So he's in the world that's been defiled by sin. And what do we know about defilement? Is death, decay, getting old, and gravity. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that, right? Gravity is not from God when it comes to our physical bodies, okay? I'll leave the word pictures for you. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight, so I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Pilate therefore said to him, are you a king then? You say rightly that I'm a king. For this cause I was born, and for this cause I've come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. What's the truth? I am. 
That's Jesus. I am the truth, the way, the truth, and the life. Moses said, who should I tell him is sending me? I am. I am what? Everything you need. <laughs> Fill in the blank. Everything you need except sin, because you don't need sin. You got that free when you got born. You need less of that. And then he says, everyone who's of the truth hears my voice. And then Pilate makes this famous saying, what is truth? I am, Jesus could have said. Pilate's wife was all upset. She had a dream. She said, nothing to do with this man. And he didn't listen to his wife, just saying. Men, your wife may elbow you right now. Should have. I'm going to skip through this. I'll cover it another time. I'll just give you this verse because the apostles were, were having a little spat about who was going to be the most important. And Jesus said, it's the world. In the world, they pull rank on each other, but not so here in our kingdom. The kingdom of God in the earth has a different formula. It's not taking advantage of other people. And he says it. It shall not be so among you. You will not pull rank on other people, but whoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your servant. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Picture right here on the altar, washing people's feet, including Judas, who was going to betray him. And now I'm going to skip through this one. It's just another example. I'll get to this point, all right, because I want to wind it down. But let's just say when you come to church, you have every right to expect the presence of God. That's what we're doing when we come to church. We're not expecting another average normal. There's no such thing as normal with God. Service, not a boring, predictable routine. Look, I wore this shirt just to encourage you that spring is coming. <laughs> This is my down payment on spring. It's staying light longer. And look, that's how we have to live. And, you know, if you remember Dot Sims, if you've been here any length of time, you remember when she passed away, there was testimony after testimony after testimony. I'm going to miss her smile. She was on the greeter team, and you couldn't get past her. She was like a goalie in hockey. Like, you try to get by, she had to hug you. And she was only this big, so she was always looking up at you with this big smile on her face, and it's like... That alone could bring healing to somebody. Just somebody's kind touch. Read the statistics. There's more kids in homes today without a father than ever in America. Ha! Huh. What are we supposed to be? A loving place where people come and don't get judged and we, we accept them and say, you could do better. Whatever the thing is, you could do better. Because I know i got to do better. Not because I'm up on the mountain and I'm preaching at you. No, we're all in this thing together. So this happened in Acts chapter 2. Again, very famous portion of scripture. They said to Peter, we heard your message. What are we supposed to do? We could actually stand right now. So that's, that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> you could stand. Because I'm going to finish this here. But it's really important. You know, like what what Jesus says and, and what Peter was told to say about the Holy Spirit. Can you think of people in your life that don't know the Lord? Could you be a little louder, please? Yeah, all of us have people in our lives that don't know the Lord, and some of them are really tough nuts, aren't they? Tough nut to crack. You need a jackhammer. But the bigger they are, the harder they fall, right? Like God gets a hold of people, and, they, and their personalities just completely change. So Peter just preaches this message in Acts chapter 2, and, and the people that are there are realizing the truth of what he said. And When I tell you, when Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? That's the main question on people's minds today, right now. Is there a difference between a boy and a girl? And if there is, then why is the public school saying there isn't? And why am I paying taxes to that? I don't believe that. I believe there is a difference. Because I believe the Bible. Like, it's not real complicated, man. A four-year-old knows there's a difference between a boy and a girl. Right? So, look, I mean, I don't have to buy or eat what they're feeding me. We put our foot down and say no. So they want to know what the truth is. And you say God and they think church. 
So say a relationship with the living God. That's the answer. You are not going to be a robot. Kneel, sit, stand up, do this, put the money in the plate. No. He's alive. God's alive. He loves you. He wants to be your father. Everything that you didn't get from your earthly father, he gives you more than, than what you needed. And it's who he wants to be. And he wants me to think first as son. And you women as daughters, like that's our first identity. So they say to Peter, what should we do? Now that we heard that we crucified the Messiah, what should we do? And he says, repent. And that every one of you, we know, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And look, you know, people get hung up about whether it's baptized in the name of Jesus or Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's just majoring on the minors. That's not what he's doing here. Peter's just saying, look, the first thing you do is you have to acknowledge you were looking at the wrong GPS. You need to reprogram that thing. You need to redirect the way you're thinking. you got to disconnect from the wrong way of thinking. Offer your life up as a living sacrifice, and God will bless you. And then why would they say be baptized? Because the Jews, speaking to a lot of Jews, knew that it represented Exodus coming out of the slavery to sin. When they came through the Red Sea, this is what they believed when they would go get baptized by John the Baptist. It was, my old life is gone. I'm coming up a new person. I'm born again. The first time in my mother's womb was a natural birth. Now I'm coming out of the water as a Christian. So we will baptize you if you don't know the Lord and you haven't been baptized or you're rededicating your life because it's a beautiful symbolic move to your family and friends that you're taking this really seriously, that my life has changed. I got saved and I'm not the same person that I was. So would you come to my baptismal, baptismal service? And when we've done those, there's 15 people getting baptized. They all have an amazing testimony. And even if your relative came just to do you a favor, they hear all these other people giving their testimony, and it shifts their hearts. They don't, they don't expect much, I can tell you that, and God meets them right where they are. So the first thing, repent. Second thing, be baptized. And then what? You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord will call. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So can we just stop trying to figure out whether we should witness to people and just live your life in a way that is a witness to people? <laughs> An open epistle read by all men, and that starts by looking in the mirror <laughs> and saying, how can I be more like you today, God? And then all these opportunities open. So I just want to bless you. We do want to invite anybody who doesn't know the Lord, if you're here today or anybody watching online, this is exactly how every one of us here became born-again Christians. This is the second birth process that Jesus was telling Nicodemus. You were born once, you become born again when you receive God's Holy Spirit through repentance and baptism. Simple, right? Can we say the prayer, church? Heavenly Father, I repent of the sin in my life. I recognize I can't save myself, but you can save me from the consequences of that sin. I turn from that other way and towards you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I renounce that sin and I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit to overflowing, change my nature. I receive you as my Lord and Savior today in Jesus' name. It's that simple, church. It's that simple. It's crying out to God. It's getting them to change the way they're thinking and, and reverse the curse that the world gave them and step into the adoption of Father God. And if anybody here said it, please come up to the altar. If you said that prayer and, and the Holy Spirit's been working on you in this service, don't leave and just get in your car. Come down. Talk to people. Come to the altar. We'll give you a Bible. We'll help you understand how to live the rest of your life prospering including the healings that we saw today. Amen? So can I just bless you guys before you go? Can you lift your hands? Thank you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for this radical remnant, King of Kings and the Somerset Hills and those that are watching and those people that couldn't be here today. We're not going to leave here the same way that when we walked in. Thank you for the testimonies. Thank you for the healing. I'm also sensing some of you have prophetic gifts on the inside of you that need to be stirred and trained and developed. So we're here to do that. If that's you, come to the altar. Let us, let us work on that. Let us speak it into you. Let us 
do an impartation of whatever he's given us. That's how this works. You pay it forward. So, Lord, I thank you for all the gifts that are represented in this building right now and those that are watching online, that the gifts will be stirred up and be brought to the surface and amplified and multiplied so that your kingdom will be as well. In Jesus' name. Love you guys.